Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Well, for those of you who listen in on these interviews, you know that I'm really fascinated with technology and how technology is really changing the way that we look at our brains and understand our brains for that matter. So today we have joining us um, Dr. Andre Iramia. He's from USC. He's a quantitative neuroscientist, gerontologist, and biomedical engineer. Thank you so much, Dr. Iramia, for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Okay, let's start about, you know, I have been told or I've read in various places that we really only know like 1% of, we really understand about 1% of how the brain works, is of, of what there is to know. Is, is that true? Do we really know so little about the brain um, in terms of understanding how it works, how it ages, everything? Uh, well, it's interesting because uh, there's been such tremendous progress in the past few decades. And in some ways, we know quite a lot. We know a lot about the organization of the brain. We know about the areas of the brain that are affected by Alzheimer's disease and by aging. And we know a lot about the processes that take place in the brain that give rise to mental health disease or to other neurodegenerative diseases. But uh, you're right, there is a lot that remains to be explored and that remains to be discovered, and uh, we're happy to be at that frontier. Okay, so you your lab is really looking at you, how to use uh, artificial intelligence to really understand how our brains are aging. So let's just back up first and say, I, I want to hear about the AI, but first, how much can imaging tell us about our brains? I mean, MRIs, uh, you know, there's different ways of Im imaging from MRIs to PET scans. Um, not everyone's able to get a PET scan. So let's just talk about that earlier stage. People are a bit worried about their memory. They may be getting a cognitive assessment and an MRI for that matter. What can you see in our brains to tell us how old um, they are in terms, in terms of an image? So it's quite remarkable that uh, uh, multimodal imaging, so imaging the brain using more than one modality, such as MRI or CT or PET, uh, can reveal a tremendous amount uh, about how our brains are aging. And uh, there's been a, a lot of research in, in the past several years and several decades to integrate these techniques and help us to understand how our brains might be aging in ways that can um, predict the, uh, is, uh, the, our risk for disease. So uh, it's actually quite interesting with, that with MRI, you can map some very uh, subtle features of the brain that can uh, reveal the extent of uh, atrophy, so the extent of shrinking of certain parts of the brain uh, with uh, some functional techniques like PET and, and other techniques. You can image uh, the activity of the brain and get insight into whether there are deficits of brain activity that could be reflective of Alzheimer's disease processes. And uh, this is one This is one of the reasons why uh, MRI and, and PET and all these other imaging techniques have really uh, taken hold of the medical field in ways that uh, help clinicians to identify and to uh, diagnose persons with cognitive impairment, including Alzheimer's. What does an aging brain look like um, on uh, through imaging? Is it do we all kind of age? You know, as as we physically age, we get wrinkles, <laughs> our hair turns gray. Um, what does an aging brain look like? Does everybody's brain age in the same way? Uh, so, in the aging brain, typically we see commonalities across most people. We see uh, a phenomenon called atrophy, which means the shrinking of the brain matter. Uh, and we also see uh, something called ventricular enlargement. And the ventricles are these fluid-filled structures in, in our brains that dilate with age as our brains shrink. So these, these and other uh, features of brain aging are very apparent uh, throughout most people. However, there are also 
abnormal patterns of aging that may be seen in uh, mostly uh, persons with disease. Uh, so for example, in Alzheimer's disease, we see uh, tremendous changes in a, a part of the brain called the temporal lobes, where we see a lot of atrophy, a lot of shrinking, and also in the hippocampus, which is a structure in the brain that's responsible and involved in memory formation. So there are patterns in the brain, in the aging brain, that uh, can tell us a lot about the type of uh, disease processes. And this is something that we've been trying to leverage as we developed our uh, approach to estimate brain age. Okay, so you're now using artificial intelligence to determine how brains are aging. What, what have you found out? Well, what we found out is actually quite interesting. First of all, we found that there are different patterns of aging that are quite subtle, uh, that are different in men versus women. So men's and, and women's brains age somewhat differently. And although there had been research on this before, uh, we were able to identify using our AI approach some patterns that are very subtle and that we could map across the whole brain and that we could then use to understand the sex differences um, better. So that's one, one thing we learned. Another thing we learned is that uh, in Alzheimer's disease, there is, as you know, a difference in risk between men and women in the risk of Alzheimer's. Females are at higher risk for Alzheimer's and uh, it's not yet clear why. Uh, and using this AI tool again, uh, based on our work to understand differences in brain aging across the sexes, we also noticed that some of these differences are actually based on uh, differences in sex that translate into differences in um, aging patterns between the sexes that lead to Alzheimer's disease. So it seems that uh, part of the reason Alzheimer's is more frequent in females is uh, perhaps uh, based on the fact that uh, female, the female brain ages a bit differently from the male brain. So we found that very interesting. That's really interesting. What did you see uh, what, when you say they age differently, um, women age differently than men in terms of their brains? What did that look like? Uh, well, there is a, a very interesting phenomenon uh, called uh, laterality in the brain. In other words, certain brain functions are uh, relying more heavily on one side of the brain, say the left side, compared to the right side. And uh, the fact that we are, for example, left-handed or right-handed is based on this kind of uh, laterality. And what we notice is that uh, some of the patterns of aging and differences between men and women are due to this phenomenon of laterality. And uh, for example, what we saw is that uh, the dominant hemisphere, so in other words, the, the hemisphere that's usually larger in a person, depending on whether they are left-handed or right-handed, is actually atrophying uh, slower in one sex versus the other. The subdominant hemisphere, in other words, the part of the brain that's not being used as much, is actually more vulnerable uh, to aging in men, but not in women. So, so there is this very interesting laterality effect that seems to be uh, mediated by sex. And, and so it's uh, a very interesting uh, new finding on the uh, aging of the brain. So did that mean, though, that women's brains, um, their more dominant side would age faster, or it's just their, their less dominant side didn't age as fast as men's? Uh, it's the latter. So, so the subdominant uh, uh, hemisphere of the brain will age a bit slower in women than it does in men. So men are a bit more vulnerable to these laterality effects. And if you think of the, the uh, adage, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it, that applies to the brain as well. And uh, in, in the case of brain aging, it applies particularly to men because the subdominant hemisphere seems to be aging uh, faster than in females. Which is counterintuitive to the fact that more women than men get Alzheimer's. So, it, yeah, it's interesting to see. So, so maybe our brains look 
like they're aging faster, but that's not, that's, you can't compare that to cognition. Is that possible? Uh, well, there are certain uh, functions that we, we, we have examined. So we have looked at how the patterns of aging in the brain uh, relate to uh, patterns of cognitive performance. And we found actually that our uh, AI tool was much better able to predict uh, cognitive impairment seen in mild cognitive impairment, for example, and in Alzheimer's disease, much better than the actual chronological age of the person. And so um, we hope that this tool will be useful in estimating risk for cognitive impairment uh, much earlier than currently possible because we are relying on identifying patterns of aging and aging starts very early uh, in uh, our 20s. So, uh, so then we have a, a process that takes place across the entire lifespan and uh, certainly across adulthood. And if we can find these patterns of aging that extend throughout the middle age, that would be a a tremendous of tremendous help in identifying people who might be at higher risk. So um, you say we start to age in our 20s. Um, do all brains, I mean, you use the expression, if you use it, you know, you don't lose it. Um, do all brains have to age? Do, you know, is that just inevitable? Is it true when people say, oh, my memory's not as good or, oh, I'm not as quick as I used to be? Is that true? As far as we know, aging is uh, a universal phenomenon in, in mammals, including humans. However, the rate of aging is very much uh, variable from one person to the next. And in fact, that's one of the uh, facts that was of tremendous help to us as we developed this AI tool, because we relied on these differences in the pace of aging across individuals. And uh, we see how, uh, how interesting uh, it is to look at these differences and to identify the personal, the patient-specific profile of aging. And so, for example, with um, healthy diet and plenty of exercise, the brain ages a bit slower. Uh, there are populations out there where in fact, uh, they're getting so much exercise that their bra brains age very slowly. On the other hand, there are groups that have brains that age much faster. For example, in alcoholism or drug abuse, the brain is aging much faster. Um, in obesity, the rates of brain shrinking are, are faster as well. So when we have um, conditions like obesity, alcoholism, drug um, abuse, is that reversible in our brains? Because those are caused not by just our natural biology, but they actually are caused um, by, you know, for a reason. So is it, can we reverse aging? I guess I'm asking when it, in those types of cases. Uh, well, the brain uh, turns out to have a remarkable capacity for bouncing back. And there's been uh, research uh, suggesting that uh, if these uh, uh, toxic habits are discontinued, uh, the brain can uh, gain some of its previously lost functions and, and recover to some extent. Now, some of the damage uh, may very well be permanent, depending from case, looking from uh, case to case, but uh, the brain does have the ability to recover to some extent. And uh, actually, uh, it's, it's larger than we might anticipate. And uh, what we saw uh, in these individuals who um, have uh, recovered from alcoholism and, and other uh, similar conditions is that uh, their brains start to atrophy. They start to shrink uh, slower than they did while uh, these individuals uh, were alcoholics. So it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon to map and to understand. So is, is the AI tool being used currently, or is it still being researched as to how effective it is uh, to diagnose or to assess brain age? So currently, uh, this tool is available to the public uh, from a, a website that's actually listed in uh, the paper that we published. And uh, it's available to researchers and really anyone 
who would like to try it out, what is needed to use it is an, a, a high quality research grade MRI scan and some pre-processing. So it's not quite the kind of tool that anyone can, um, can use readily, but it is available to other researchers worldwide and anyone who uh, has the data and time uh, uh, commitment to, uh, to uh, analyze uh, these brains. And so we made this public so that others can uh, use our tool to learn uh, get, and gain more insights about the brain. Uh, and, and we're happy to do that. So d does that mean, though, if it's open to the public and let's say I got an MRI and some sort of checkup, I could upload my results or do I need to do it through through a doctor? So what would happen is that uh, you would need to download our software and uh, there is uh, a little bit of expertise needed in uh, learning how to run it, but it's it's not very difficult for someone with uh, some uh, programming experience because it's a software package that's uh, it doesn't it has a, a programming like interface, but uh, it does take as input the the uh, MRI scan uh, with some pre processing and then uh, generates a number which is the biological age of the individual whose um, MRI was uploaded. So that's that's. Fascinating. Um, it, does it assign you an age then? Your, your brain is X years old. Yes. So uh, it does not know the uh, sex or the age or really anything about the person. Uh, and it usually, it, it will uh, usually guess age fairly accurately in persons who are cognitively normal. Uh, in individuals who have Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, uh, it'll actually be off by a number of years and the difference between the true age and the age predicted by the uh, software is something called an age gap that tells us how much older the brain of that person is than expected for a cognitively normal person of, of that age. So for example, if uh, you upload the, brain, uh, the scan of a 70 year old uh, who might have Alzheimer's disease, and the software says that person is 75, then that means that the difference, 75 minus 70, the five, those five years, is the extent of uh, additional aging in that person that's due to the disease or to other processes. And so this is five years, uh, this is a brain that's five years older than expected for someone of age 70. Right. We're getting some questions um, coming in. This is a good question as well. So you talked about Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, this person is asking, do brains of people affected by childhood trauma seem to be affected more than those who don't have the trauma? How much of the aging that causes Alzheimer's is from environmental factors? Can we determine that through this AI tool? Well, I think it's certain the tool can certainly be used uh, uh, to help uh, studies of that kind. Uh, what has been seen, uh, not in our research, but other uh, researchers have found that persons who uh, went through trauma in their childhood uh, have uh, are at higher risk for um, anxiety and depression throughout their lives and may even be at higher risk for uh, other disorders of the brain um, it's unclear that uh, they are at high risk for Alzheimer's, but uh, it, uh, this trauma um, that the question mentions is uh, actually a potential uh, contributor to accelerated aging. Uh, we do need to do more research in that area, which uh, we haven't done yet, but it is certainly a, a compelling uh, hypothesis. So now that you have a bit of data, uh, how accurate can you say, or can you yet, do you have enough data to say how accurate this AI tool is? Uh, so we're very proud of the fact that actually of, uh, of all the tools that have been developed to estimate brain age, ours is so far the, the most accurate. And uh, the average error in uh, persons who are cognitively normal is uh, about two years. So plus or minus two years is the average error. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, this is the best that one can get so far from uh, MRIs. And 
uh, we're excited because this is usually uh, much smaller, uh, much smaller error than uh, needed to quantify aging in persons with Alzheimer's disease, where you have accelerated aging that's considerably more than just the two years of our error. So Dr. Aramia, can you um, tell us what the site is? Because I'm sure people want it, will want to know, and we can have my, my producer, Katie, can put it into the chat. What, what is the website? Sure. So I can I can bring it up here and uh, and post it and put it in the in the chat. I'll just need a minute to open the the paper and, and copy it. Okay, no problem. And then we can post it um, in the chat. Uh, but you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about not only diagnosis in that early stage. I mean, for for those of us who have loved ones with Alzheimer's, my mom, um, you know, is entering a later stage of Alzheimer's. Would we be able to understand where she's at in, you know, within the defined stages of Alzheimer's? Um, would this help us say, okay, now she's entering stage six or seven according to her brain age? Uh, well, uh, I think some of that can be mapped using our tool because the stages of Alzheimer's uh, are related to uh, the, the extent of. Uh, uh, additional brain aging that the disease causes. So I do believe there is a relationship between the, uh, the amount of excessive aging seen in, in, according to uh, the stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, now, uh, there is also the question of how the brain ages that we predict are related to the cognitive impairment extent and severity of the person. And what our study has shown is actually that uh, we have very good agreement, especially in certain cognitive tests and pertaining to certain aspects of cognition, uh, that uh, very excellent, we have excellent agreement between our predicted brain ages and the, the stage of, uh, of Alzheimer's in these uh, individuals. However, we do need to uh, be careful because there is a lot of heterogeneity uh, in, in this group, and so we do need to do more studies on, on that. Uh, and so we cannot always say with confidence that in any single individuals or that in every single individual, the uh, software will capture things as well as on average. Okay, and I just got that link um, and Katie will will put it in, in our talk um, messages so other people can get it. What about predicting or understanding different types of dementia through uh, this tool. It, it, would that be helpful? I mean, you know, we know misdiagnosis is a huge problem. People are often diagnosed with Alzheimer's when it's not Alzheimer's, it's another type of dementia, Lewy body, for example. Could this help us or help doctors understand really what type of dementia uh, their patients are facing? I think that for differential diagnosis, this tool is probably um, not as helpful, partly because we're using uh, MRIs. And from MRIs alone, uh, it is rarely uh, possible to do very accurate differential diagnosis of Alzheimer's versus frontotemporal dementias or dementia with Lewy bodies and so forth. Uh, usually that kind of differential diagnosis has to involve uh, a more comprehensive uh, imaging and medical examination of the patient so even, uh, uh, even with uh, all the MRIs we, we might uh, use to train this neural network, uh, this, this type of tool uh, is not there yet. However, uh, this is a very interesting question because uh, to, do, uh, to do this kind of differential diagnosis uh, using a tool like ours might very well be within the abilities of AI in general. And we were very interested in extending our uh, the capability of our software to uh, to do this kind of work, but uh, we we do need to uh, acquire more data and to uh, have larger data sets to uh, to look at before we can say that we can uh, classify patients according to diagnosis. Dr. Andre Iremia, thank you so much for joining us. It's fascinating and we would love it. If you find out more, uh, please let us know. We'd love to hear more. Um, we've posted the link to the site um, in the chat or we will if we haven't. Um, 
And, you know, please let us know and keep us abreast of what's what you're discovering, because I we all know as more data means um, you you find out more with with artificial intelligence. Thanks very much for joining us today. And thank you for having me. So if anyone missed some of this interview, please know we always post on uh, beingpatient.com. Um, you, you, and don't forget to subscribe to our newsletters because within our newsletter, we let you know about upcoming talks like these. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Thank you.